is my pleasure today to welcome Brad Hodgins um, to be our presenter. Brad has been with um, Nav Air for 36 years and has over 20 years experience developing simulation and avionics software. For the past 16 years, he's been in a coach and instructor um, and doing their versions of PSP, TSP, performance resource team, um, and helping teams develop high quality products on time, on budget. So Brad's got a national reputation and in his bio here, you can see the um, significant awards that he's won. Um, he has his doctorate from, in computer science from Colorado, Colorado Technical University. Um, he retired from government service in 2019, but continues to support NAVAIR as a contractor. So um, I've known Brad for a really long time. I've had the pleasure of working with him. So um, I've heard a very short version of this talk before. So I'm very excited to hear the full length presentation. So with that, Brad, I'm gonna stop my show and then I guess you can start sharing. Great. I'm also gonna mute myself as soon as you get going. Okay, so you have to let me know. Can everyone see that, the title slide? I see it, Brad. Good, all right, great. Okay, and just to make sure um, you guys can see my mouse moving around around the, minute, the word minutes. Yes, good, okay, yes, great. Can. All right, so we'll start it up now. So, this is, a, like Julia mentioned, this is a, a presentation that I gave uh, I put together overnight to give to a, a presentation of the STEAM meeting in Pittsburgh in January. Uh, boy, is it this year? <laughs> it's a long, long time ago with the COVID-19. All right, so, uh, so yes, how to manage $30 million and 150 projects in 90 minutes. The 90 minutes comment comes from the fact that we didn't have much time to be able to teach the people running the 150 projects how to manage them. And that's what made the major constraints. Even though it was $30 million and a lot of people, we were able to do it and make a difference in 90 minutes. And that's what we're going to show you. All right, so 2018. Uh, fiscal years in the government go from uh, October through September. So in uh, that fiscal year, 2018, um, someone came up to the PRT and said, hey, I've got tens of millions of dollars that I've I, help, I dole out 100 plus research and development projects. And some of them are small, some of them are big. I need more insight into what's happening to them. Right now, all I'm measuring is how much, time, how much money they're spending. And I'm not really getting any feel for what the bang for the buck is. And I've got my management, there's a customer saying, so my management asking me to get more insight so that we can make decisions about when to stop good money going after bad and things of that nature and prioritize. So it, this is a problem they came up to us and they, they say, hey, look, because some of the projects are so small, I mean, 10K is a couple of weeks of, of labor of a new person. And then $10 million would be maybe the first or one year of many years with hardware being developed and teams of people doing work. So a huge range, what is that, a thousand times uh, range there? So because of those small ones, though, we have to make sure that whatever solution we give him is easy on the project lead. And so we have this constraint to make sure that it's easy for them to do and doesn't eat up their $10,000 just trying to say where they are. And then also, another constraint we had was to add this ability to say, we, don't, we know there's a lot of projects here. We don't want to be overwhelmed. The senior managers want to be overwhelmed. The tables and tables of data trying to tell them something. They wanted something concise to be able to say, what's the status of the 100, 200 projects or whatever. Uh, and by the way, this was came to us in the middle of the fiscal year. So given October to September, they came to us in March, April timeframe and said, please help us yesterday. And they had a lot of pressure to get something going. And so the PRT sat down and came up with a a solution. That's what I want to walk through you with. All right. So, separate from 
this customer coming to us and asking us for his help, we've been working with other members of NavAir to try to figure out what's the absolute minimum we can do to have a team, have a project, keep track of, and maximize the chances of being successful. And we gave it the phrase five factors. And here's the five factors. So one of them is a team lead or a project lead should know how much of the project's done. And over here on the left, you see a chart that shows over time what percent of the project's been completed. So if a project lead knows that, so they will be above the curve or ahead of the curve on all the rest of the projects that have trouble trying to deliver on time. Another factor that we identified was how much funding is spent. Now, this, this phrase BFM, I don't define it in here in writing. It's a budget financial manager. This slide is from the trading slides. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have a couple more unique slides and then most of the work is grabbed from the training material we gave to the uh, the people that were going to manage the projects to be given us money. So I'll, I'll try to catch other acronyms that, are, that they know about, I didn't have to define, but uh, give it you a background. And so the money being spent, you have to understand how much money they spent. That's something else. If a project lead knows that, they're going to be ahead of the curve. Now this third one I hear about, when will the project be complete? That's not when they think they want to have the project complete. What we're talking about here is looking at their progress, see this blue line over here on how much the project's done, and having something say, at this pace, this is when this project will be finished. And if the project lead knows that, they can say, oh, if I don't do something, I'm going to be late. Or, good, it looks like I'm going to be early. Great, no problem. All of these are indications to help the project lead understand, I need to manage my project or else it's going to come out the rails. Uh, fourth one is the status of the project's risks. Here's a little table here that really simple one-liners about these are possible risks that, that this project might experience and some ways to categorize it. We'll talk about that in a couple of slides. And then major changes to the project. Now this one here is basically saying uh, it's a CYA thing. Uh, my customer keeps changing my requirements or I've, had, I've lost half my people during my project. It's a way of describing what's happened to the project since it started. So that when someone, the upper manager comes to this team lead, project lead says, how can you're behind? They have a story to tell as opposed to, well, I don't know. And so again, if they keep this track, they know what's happening to them. Oh, that's a good thing. Oh, that's a bad thing. Oh, that's a bad thing. And it causes them to go to their customer and say, hey, look, I know I'm only halfway through this project, but I want to let you know what this is costing me or this problem has occurred and let's talk about it. So all these things, these five major factors we found would lead to a successful team, successful project if they were managed. All right, so our solution. Um, we know that we have these teams, projects just have a little bit of money. And so we need to make sure that we didn't waste all that time trying to get the team trained up on a new tool. So we decided to use some five factors, which is simple and put it in an Excel workbook, which everybody pretty much has exposure to, especially the project leads. People in the trenches may not, but the project leads got there for a reason. They probably know how to, how to spell Excel. So in addition to that, you know, that, that keeps the, the, simple, the simple overhead of the solution as far as uh, the project lead not spending a lot of time trying to manage it. More on that in a couple of slides. But the other constraint about trying to keep a simple picture to senior management, what we did is we came up with a chart, or I should say the customer saw this snail chart, and I'll explain it to you in a second, and he saw, that's just what I want. Can we make that work for our problem? And so let me explain what a snail chart is. So this is something that um, we were beating around in, in uh, team process integration and in team software process at NavAir. And it was so beneficial that we asked uh, David Tuman of the, uh, the process, uh, process dashboard to add it to the tool. He did. So here's what this, this table is showing, this chart showing. You have these four, you can set them four projects, the four projects that have a history about where they were and where they are now. And like this yellow orange one here, it isn't moving. So it's been there, it's stable. 
over time. But what is it trying to say? Well, the up and down part of this table is talking about how well this project did on estimating their availability. The availability is how many hands do I have working on the pile of rocks that has to be done for this project to be completed. So if you uh, underestimate your availability, that means that you thought you only have someone for half time, but it turns out to be on full time and great, you're getting more time for people to work on the project. Uh, more hours per week, you think of it that way. Now, on the lower half, you get down the lower side, this is when you say, well, I thought I was gonna have Jimmy full time, but it looks like he's been, been taken half time to some of the project, and therefore I don't have as many hours a week of his time. And so you, under, you overestimate the availability of the people working the project. So that's the up and down part. The left and right is the same kind of thing, but for the effort that you thought it would take to get the job done. And so if your job is to generate 15 presentations and dig 50 feet of ditch, then if you underestimated the labor it would take to do that job, you would end up to the right of this chart. If you overestimated the labor you thought it would take to do the job, you'd be on the left side of this chart. So the combination of these two factors, they weren't the only two factors that drive a project, but we found that they're significant. And if you get a good handle on your estimates of the labor it takes to do the job, and an estimate of the availability of people to do the job, you're gonna end up in the middle of this chart. You'll have a good plan, and you're gonna finish the project on time. Now, if you underestimate the time it takes to do the job, which is common, and you overestimate the availability of your team members, you'll end up in this lower left, lower right corner. You'll have, you'll have a bad plan, your, your assumptions will be bad. You can fix it for the next time, but this time it's bad, you're gonna probably finish late. Most likely finish late. Now, on the flip side, you can really pad it. And that's not really the job of TPI and TSP. The job is to be in that green spot. But if you have bad estimates and you underestimate your availability of people, and you overestimate the labor takes to do the job. Yeah, you're gonna finish early, but you still have a bad plan. You got lucky. Lucky went for you that's just in a good direction. Your customer might be happy because you finish early, but as far as your availability to pick the next project, it's up in the air because you didn't make a very good job of estimating how long it'll take to this one. Now, this other white area is the same kind of thing, but maybe you're balancing the problems, like down here in the lower left. You overestimated what it would take, but you you overestimated the availability of people as well. And so there's like a plus and a minus, and they offset each other. And you may finish on time, but it's still a bad plan. You just had offsetting offsetting mistakes. Same thing on the upper right. You over you underestimate availability, but you underestimate the labor it takes. So they offset each other. Same thing. Look on all the four corners of this. You have bad plan all around because your assumptions were wrong. But if your assumptions are in the ballpark, then you have a good plan, you're gonna finish on time because you have a good plan. Now, the customer saw this chart and went, I love that. And the fact that there's a dot for each project, you can put 50, 60, 80 dots on there and you'll get a feel for which projects are, have a good plan and are close to their plan, and which ones are not and are far away from it. So we took that, even though these, these topics is X and Y, uh, X and Y topics didn't really apply to the to the problem the customer had. We came up with something that reflected it. When we talked about whether a project was over budget or under budget, or whether a project was ahead of schedule or behind schedule, with the concept being that um, if they're on budget, if they're spending money the rate they thought they would spend, then they'd be in the center instead of left or right. And if they're making progress at the rate they thought they're going to make progress then they wouldn't be high, they wouldn't be low, and they'd be in the center. So the same kind of thing applies. The same kind of concept I showed you on the little left applies to the right. But because we're talking about senior management, we're just going to focus on this bad area over, over budget and, and by schedule. That's an obviously a bad area. We want to bring that to their attention, senior management. Otherwise, you just draw some circles saying they're plus or minus 10, plus or minus 20%, plus or minus 50%. And a project would be a dot. And so we came up with this, and they, they love the idea, and they, they're really looking forward to trying it out. And they thought that'd be easy to digest for senior management. All right, so now, this group of people that have the $20 million in the 100 plus projects, they call themselves the 219 program office because that was the law 
that allowed them, the 219 was the section of some law that was written up. And so they just kind of took on that name. So they have the money, and down here at the bottom, there's principal investigators, which is what they call their project leads. And so every principal investigator belonged to some organizations, like uh, expendables or weapons or range control. And so you have the people with the money and the people with the, with the topics they want to look into. And so what we did, we stood up in the middle to our solution, a bunch of these little spreadsheets, one for each project, and a single spreadsheet or workbook that had the big picture. And there was data going back and forth between these two. Another piece of the problem is the dollars. And so we didn't want the project leads dealing with the dollars and trying to get their dollars spent every, every week. And so all the time card charges and all the expenditure charges were all in this tool called um, Enterprise Resource Plan. Or process and it's all the navy all the navigator dollars being spent are in this application and so this is something else is involved in our solution now here's the interaction between them all and this is again from a slide from the for the teaching of the to the pis we're not going to go over these in detail i just want to go on a high level saying in the beginning the the investigator says hey i got an idea it's going to cost fifty thousand dollars to do it what do you think and they put that proposal in and then there's a discussion and the 219 program says, I like it, let's do it. And then they, they tell the principal investigator, give me more details, come up with your plan. And so initialize a plan and then they start executing. And so they track their progress as they get the work done, they spend money, they sign things off and they track their progress. And then periodically they say, hey, here's my status. And so they submit their status to that master workbook. And then every month they keep tracking and reporting their status. And that's just really simple. This is what we taught them. So this is what you're going to go through. And by the time we did this, they were in the initializing the project phase. And so we were trying to show them, okay, here's what I got to do to initialize your project. So that's the layout. I'm going to show you a couple of slides on initializing the project on how to track and submit. So you know what they did. And this, again, was all taught in 90 minutes. You only had them for an hour and a half. So this is another slide from the training material. I said, hey, look, you already did this. You gave your, gave your title to your project, and you said who you are and how much money you want, and a paragraph or two or a quad chart on what you want to do with that money. Now, I'm going to give a couple of slides to you guys about how to initialize the project. And this was the a main part of, of training for them, is these different pieces. Some of them are really important. Some of them are just they need to be done. And I'll go over those the important ones in a couple of slides. And then there's the tracking, which we'll get, get into more detail. So we talked about this at a high level with them during the 90 minutes. And then the idea of submitting is that, hey, look, it's up to you to submit your status. We're not going to take your status unless you're ready to submit it. And more on that in a couple of slides. And then we just told them, hey, look, that's it. That's all you have to do is do three and four every month. So it'll take you a few minutes. That's what we really didn't nail it down to is that we did on our solution. We came up with it in a couple of weeks. And we sat down and looked at it and said, is it truly going to be done in a couple of minutes a month? And they already agreed that was, that was what it would take. So let's talk about that uh, phase two, where we're initializing the plan. So in this case here, dollars are super important. So one of the things that we have them do, this is one of the sheets of the workbook, is to lay out over the fiscal year, that's where the, the time frame for these two nineteen dollars is, is that they would do all this in like the big, um, August or July, and then they would people would know going into the fiscal year, I've got eighty-two thousand dollars, and here's where how I think I need to spend it. And so it might vary based upon where the labor comes in and where labor goes, or if they're buying hardware. And every project's different. This is research and development. They're they're all very unique. They're trying to really have a a, a system where we're not assuming that they're producing software or they're producing. IC chips or they're producing boxes, every project's going to be different. And so we basically had them yellow, say, look at the yellow field, fill that out, and then make sure that there's another spot of the workbook that has a total budget. Make sure this adds up. And as you put it in here, it, it will do that automatically. But by the way, go back and look at your budget and make sure you put 82,000 back there. So low tech, low tech solution. We didn't have time to make this bulletproof. 
And we gave them a graphic, uh, graphic generated automatically as they did this to say, here's what it looks like. So if they saw this huge front loaded or back loaded, they saw what they were putting in there. Okay. Uh, another part of initializing the plan is the risks. Uh, they would have to submit this before they could get approval and get a charge object to proceed. And so they needed to have some indication that they considered their risks and that they did some decent job of trying to come up with what the risks are. If a project lead or PI, project principal risk here, didn't have any risks, then someone from the 219 project would give them a call and say, hey, I looked over your plan. I don't see anything there. What's going on? And then there'd be a discussion about, well, it's so simple. I don't have any risks. And then they'd talk to it, and the, the 219 folks would be happy and say, all right, thumbs up. Give them a, give them a charge object. This is a super low-tech way to do risk planning. Uh, there are much more complicated risk mitigation plans and project or program level risk for integrated product team. Uh, but this is a simple one, again, an Excel workbook with a, a, a legend down here to give guidance to the team, to the project leader, principal investigator about what to do. But this is pretty much saying, hey, look, every risk has a likelihood, small, medium, small, medium, or low, or high, high medium, or low, just simple percentage. And if it happens, what kind of impact is it to our project? Schedule delay, or I just can't do it. And so we, we, we don't try to teach them the principles of risk management. We just show them and it's there. Most of them recognize this because, again, they're, they're project leads. They didn't get here uh, one week out of college. And so we tell them in, in this half, hour and a half of training, if you need more information about this, give us a call offline. We'll gladly walk through it and give you the, the uh, theory behind this. So we provide it to them and tell them that they don't know how to use it and they want to and they need to come talk to us. This is probably Given the dollars also is important, this is probably the most important part of their plan is the product table. And we try to use, again, a generic term product. So this is basically the pile of rocks that they're going to do something, they're going to process and handle with the money they're asking for. Now, this example here, I put something about $82,000 for this UGV demo, unpiloted ground vehicle. So basically, it's an RC car, but not even RC car, it's got an AI driving it. And so this is a similar to other research and development projects, just to make it so it doesn't have foobar and, and foo in here, nonsense words. And so what they're doing here is they're laying out, what, do I, what am I going to do with $82,000? And you have these things you're going to produce, so the services you're going to provide, like here's performing tests, here's developing our software, here's uh, and figure out requirements, laying out the track. And so here in this estimate is super important because the estimate says how big of a piece of the pie is each of these items I'm going to do. I'm going to do six things, and this one here to develop the software is going to be uh, almost half of the, of the pile, 41%. And so this is, even though it says estimate in weeks, we tell them during the training this is not meant to be how much labor. This is meant to represent, where's the big rocks in your pile? Where's the inner pound gorilla? And to make sure these are relatively sized to each other so that when you sign off one of these pieces, you're getting the credit that you deserve for having finished that big hunk of piece or a relatively minor piece. And so they lay this out. And again, the, the 219 folks look at this initially and they go, I don't agree with that, I don't understand it. And they give them a call and say, what are you trying to tell me? And, and then they have to pass that wicket, pass that, that gatekeeper. And then, of course, nothing's been started. So the initial plan is nothing, none of these rocks have been started. So this is super important for the tracking. Okay. Now, that's the main part of the initial plan. There are more pieces than that, but those are the main, main ones. And we showed them on, on the, the 90 minutes, the other slides talking about uh, how, to, how to do those other pieces. Now, this is now in the, in the phase where we're tracking. So they've got their plan initialized. They had 219 folks like it, gave them a charge object, and now they've got their people on board. They're October, November, December, and now they're doing the work. So there's two things that are happening here in the tracking. One is during the month, they're touching that table and they're changing the status of it as they start to work on some of those rocks or they finish some of those rocks. And so they're just updating the table. Now, 
In here in the middle, you see it's, there's options for the status of each product. This is a, a very simple earned value technique. Now, earned value is a way of getting progress without asking someone's opinion. So when it says, well, how much work do you have left to do? Earned value is a way to make it so that it's not subjective. Eh, I think I've got two weeks left. No, you just set the flags on all the rocks in your pile about whether they're not started, started, or completed, and then the percent complete comes out the end. And that's it, it's not up to, up to consideration. Either you have not started it, you started it, completed it, and based upon that, you get this percent of credit. And that percent of credit is based upon the size of the piece of the pie it is. That's why those relative sizes are important. And so we're basically giving them a little bit of earned value during the 90 minutes here. And we keep it super simple, no progress, 50% progress just for starting it, and you only get 100% when you finish it. And they all understood that, and they all said, okay, got it. Now, at the end of each month, uh, they, they take their status wherever they are, and they move it to the next piece. So let me show you that. So on, on this piece here, what you're seeing is we try to make it super simple. There's a column for each month, and uh, they have a status. And they say, hey, I finished this payment requirements for the final test run. And they would click on the cell, and they get a pull-down list. So I don't remember what the three steps are or how to spell them. They just pick the one that they wanted and the status gets changed from started to completed. And it's, uh, it's kind of hard to read, but up here you see what percent progress they have. It changed from 2.8 to 5.6. So they made some progress because they finished something that was 5.6% of the pile. And so this is how they get earned value or progress. They just change the status of these rocks to be instead of not started, to be started or completed. And they work within the months they're working in. And so at the end of each month, the second part is, they take their status wherever they are, the end of October, and they copy and paste it to November. Why couldn't they automate this? We couldn't automate this because we're trying to make it get to the people as soon as possible because customers came to us mid-year and said, we need something yesterday. So we threw it together, made it as bulletproof as possible, so we need to rely on the PIs or project leads to do some of the work. So low tech, but they would basically copy where they were the October 31st, paste it over, and then they would start modifying the November ones that they made progress in November. So pretty low tech. Now, uh, in the previous year, this, this capability of, of saying, hey, we're done, um, let me explain what happens here. So uh, what they do is they would have this button across the top here where they would say, has my status been submitted? In the beginning, after they made the initial plan, they would change this submitted to a yes for the initial plan. And that would tell the 219 folks, hey, someone raised me, look at their plan to see, and give them a charge object. But at the end of October, they would say, I'm ready. Let's take a look at what's going on here. So they'd change it to a yes, and that would cause this column to get grayed out and say, you're not, nothing, nothing special here. You should be working to the right. Now, saying that yes allows them to look at some charts. And it says, now that you've said yes, I'm gonna take your status, I'm gonna put it in some charts. And you should look at those charts and look at your project status. And if that's not the, the progress you thought you were gonna making, and this is not the amount of money you thought you'd spent, then you need to go and talk to your budget people or you need to talk to your team members and see if if they sign off everything you need to sign off. And so if those don't look right, challenge them and, and get your ducks in order. And while you're doing that, uncheck this box and say, no, I need to go resolve this. Now, there's another picture you can look at, and that's where they land on that bullseye chart we talked about. We want the team, member, the team leads to know where they sit and where senior managers going to see them sitting. This is part of the peer pressure. If you lack of a better word, they don't know where anyone else is, but they know where they are. And they say, wow, I'm in the red here. Why? And they can go manage their projects and do something about it before it's the last month of the fiscal year or before they're supposed to deliver it. And so these are giving them a visual aid to understand that they need to do something about their project. So how did it go? Uh, really cool. This is uh, the one where we fiscal 2018, this is where we started mid-year. 
we uh, we ended up having uh, helping the, the 219 folks manage 30 million dollars, and that was spread across 111 projects. Now, of those 111 projects, let's see if I have my notes here, I was really surprised that we had 88 percent of the projects followed the process. I figured 50 percent. Halfway through the year, we're telling all these people, 111 people, hey. You need to attend the training, and you need to spend some time every month doing this. I figured half of them would tell us to pack sand, but 88%, only about uh, 14 projects, I think, didn't comply. And that's these guys across the bottom here where they showed no progress. So ahead of schedule, behind schedule, they showed no progress. And so they never filled out the workbook. They may got an initial plan or something, but they never reported a monthly progress. Now. The PRT or the COPS, we were doing as much support as possible for the 219 group. But if the 219 group didn't like someone not following the process, 219 group would say, I turned off your charge object. <laughs> Don't have your attention now. And so the hearing option to do that, none of these projects were important enough to cause them to do that. But everybody else is in, I mean, the vast majority of them were in this plus or minus 50%. Now, what I didn't show on here, there's a Standish group. I'm doing okay time wise, right? I got a few more minutes. Now I'm at 35 or something like that. So and the Standish Brett, group. Yes, sir. That's, a, that's amazing. Yeah. We're all applauding, just so you know. Cool, yeah, you cool. 10 minutes. Awesome. Okay, so now what's not on here is a dot that'd be over here somewhere. The Standish group produces this. A report every year called the Chaos Report. It has different names, Chaos Manifesto, or all these different different names. They 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 kind of dance around, but essentially they go and canvas industry. Uh, they tend to focus on software, and they they talk to thousands of projects, and they try to report on what's going on. Well, normally projects are over budget and behind schedule. They deliver late. And they, they cost them more than they thought it would take. People working nights and weekends, and they still deliver late. And this is the norm. Now, other ones never finish. And, and the chaos, the Spanish group talks about that in their chaos report. Now, these are research and development projects. They are not producing a product going to the fleet. They are playing around. They have some crazy idea of what if I took this piece and this piece and put them together, and then dipped it in a sailing solution for five weeks. Hey, look, it does something pretty cool. And then it gets someone's attention. They go, wow, let me give you another million dollars. What can you do with that? And this would be an idea that might lead to something that goes to the fleet. So these are all what if projects. And so they put a plan together and they got progress at the pace they thought they were going to do. And they, just by seeing their work, monthly they had this this natural pressure for them to pay attention to their plan and to drive it some of them no but 88 percent that's pretty phenomenal and so the second year i know uh this is the first year so i was very happy with the amount of involvement second year we did some feedback from the people using it and we added some capabilities like that um that submit button so that people could say i'm ready for you to take my status and so with that kind of capability, now the, this is a sign that what the 219 folks were doing was enjoyed by senior management because senior management gave the 219 folks more money. So if they had mismanaged it, you can probably imagine this number would go down. So this number is 37 million. Now, 44 projects, you're going, why did it get a third the size? It was really initially 147 projects. And what happened is halfway through the fiscal year, there was a massive change in priorities, and they had to grab money from a bunch of the projects and move them to some of the high priority projects that were left in there. Like so a couple in particular that became huge and super important to the base. And so it ended up being 44 projects, but those 147 were doing it from the start. And a lot of the projects got cut. And I don't know how much the 219 folks use this information, but you look at it and you don't see anyone in this lower left. Every, you know, a bunch of them are in, in plus or minus 
just a couple of them outside of the 44, and only three, I think, I'm trying to remember, remember, only three didn't participate, and they had enough clout that they were able to do that, and they were too big to fail type thing, and that was, again, between the 219 project and those project leads, but again, a huge percentage of participation uh, on doing this and a lot of positive feedback. Everybody enjoyed um, having that kind of insight. Okay. Yeah, Brad, this, Brad, this, Jeff, uh, the, the, uh, the projects that they stood up in 2019, they liked it, this so well, they um, stood up five major projects that were gonna deliver to the fleet. And then, like you said, they make them $10 million projects or $20 million projects. And therefore, this is where they borrowed that money from, like you said. But yeah, there was a big cloud project, like you said, that uh, we're going to deliver stuff out to the fleet. Okay, so here's my contact information. The performance resource team is really, really enable to help. Give us a call, send us an email, and um, we can give you more information about what we did. Give you the workbook if you want to try it. None of this is proprietary with the government. We're here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right, there's no questions. No questions. All right, Julia, turn it back over to you. Okay, Brad, um, I know it's hard to like all clap, but thank you so much for such an interesting presentation.